Thank you. Thank you, Viva. Well, Jake, thank you so much for this really powerful and fascinating film. Um, how, how did the project came, come about? How did you develop the story? Um, and in particular, the character of David. Um, I, 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 I had heard this small detail about um, that no Ashkenazi guards were allowed um, to guard Eichmann, and I was st struck by that. And you know, when you're following a certain path of things, sometimes you go down these rabbit holes, and it opened up into several other things. And one was the detail about the one time use crematorium for the body, and and I went further into that and thought there's something here that, that, that I got very excited about. And I did a little bit more research on my own and started formulating kind of a, a fictional version of a Yannick movie, you know, a Yannick who goes um, to operate the oven at the end. And I put together a sort of research trip to Israel and Noah Friedman, who's one of our uh, associate producers, helped me do that, and in the process, she found this claim, um, David, the young boy's claim that he had worked at this factory. So we put together a series of sort of documentary interviews that at one point I thought we might use in the film in sort of like a red structure or something where we could look, you know, talk to the people who actually lived through the thing. But, um, and, and, in, and in gathering these testimonies and talking to these people about their experience sort of at the periphery of this event, I realized I really couldn't do this alone. Um, and it would be closer to truth or the truths that they were telling us individually. And that's when I met Tom Cheval. I became a process of also trying to find a writer to write it with. And Tom Cheval is a great director um, um, and a critic and a teacher there. Um, Ariel Schweitzer put us together and we hit it off right away. Um, and Tom came to New York, and we, uh, you know, we talked beforehand and exchanged notes and things, and we were able to make a script together. And the the cast is really marvelous. Um, maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about how you found the uh, young man who played David. Well, that I, that was the biggest thing before we started in the preparations of the movie. I really felt, and we would talk about this a lot in the office, was if we don't have a David, you know, we won't have a movie. And um, and so um, Hila Yuval, our casting director, sort of much farther afield and started searching all over the country you know, for children that weren't necessarily actors and she found um, Noam. And his first audition, just he had such um, an alive and genuine sort of emotional quality. And we just, we, we dug into that. And so the, the actor who plays the teacher in the film, in the, in, in the, in the classroom, Rotem Kanan, who we may have seen in some things, is a great actor, is also a great acting teacher. Um, Noam, at the time, didn't speak very much English. And so we developed a kind of an acting department that was really beneficial, and Rotem has such a gentle manner, and, but is also so direct and could kind of communicate um, with Noam that we developed this sort of thing together where on by the end of actually filming, and so they worked off and on a lot, and we would talk, and then when we were on set, really the communication was much more between Rotem and Noam than me and Noam. And um, what, what was it like to shoot the film in, in Israel and to have a Hebrew language script? Well, um, very, very, very difficult. I mean, the, obviously, people here who make movies understand just making a movie, very, very difficult. Making a movie in a place you're very unaccustomed to, difficult in a language you don't speak, really. Very difficult. <laughs> I mean, so the list of, of difficulties was very long, but and, and it, originally we were writing it, I wasn't thinking of it as a Hebrew language movie. Tom felt very confident that it should be... Um, in Hebrew, and we would talk about it a lot. And I understood exactly what he meant, and I kind of wanted to do it. I didn't necessarily fully trust myself, but then in the process, you know, it's a very low budgeted movie, and you start to think, well, now we're gonna do this movie in English there. There are all these variables, and, I, and what I understood was the, the big variable would be me in a Hebrew language movie, and, 
And I think that's where the part as a movie watcher, a movie lover or something, you, well, we see lots of these movies in these other languages and we seem to know, you know which ones we love or which ones we don't connect with. Let's try, let's go for it. And so in the, in the, in the process, I, it, it, seemed, it revealed itself you know, it's also the scripts are sort of ultimately programmatic, and so you're, you know you're doing things over and over again. And at a certain point, you even if your understanding of the language isn't that good, you would know that scene, and and that was really helpful. That's also, you know, if it were any other thing, it would be too difficult probably for me. But in this case, it worked. Okay, um, we can. T I have more questions, but we can take some from the audience. Um, we have people with microphones, so if you raise your hand, I'll call on you and a mic will come your way. Oh, okay, to start, right here in the front row. So I, I had two uh, quick questions. Uh, firstly, uh, how, how, why did you choose uh, the, the character of David, who is an Arab speaker? Is there a reason you chose an Arab speaker for that? That's number one. Second question is, when the group went to Poland in uh, 1961, I would imagine that that was during, the, well, I know that it was during the communist period. It must have been very difficult uh, for groups to, uh, to, to, to go to Poland at that time or for anyone to go to Poland. So uh, from a historical perspective, I'm wondering how, how realistic that was for a group at that time to visit Poland. We, we talked to people. People had gone... Um, the first groups had gone around this time, apparently, and um, so they must have been letting people in. As for David, um, so you know, David's coming to the country with his with his family from Libya. So you know, um, his father's you know obviously not integrating quite as fast as as he is. But you know, he's born um, as an Arabic speaker, so he comes to this country. You know, he's. Um, integrating much faster. But as far as um, speaking Arab, you know, he's from Libya. So why did you choose an Arab? Specifically, you, it was obviously your choice to choose a character who spoke Arabic for, for that particular role. That's what the character does, exactly. The character speaks Arabic. Oh, right here, question in the third row. Uh, I'm just wondering if you ever considered not casting an actor in the role of Eichmann. In other words, just kind of keeping him off screen or hovering just off screen, even in the scenes in which he, even in which the, in the scenes in which Eichmann actually participates. I never considered not having him in it at all. And as you say it, I, th I think maybe one of the reasons it never came to mind was then it, it feels like it almost underlines it too much. I feel like we're right on the edge. I mean, I like to think that we balanced it just right in this idea of, you know, not wanting to make a full character out of him. Audience members are bringing their own feelings about all of it with them. And so my feeling is I'm not interested um, I'm not interested in making a movie about Adolf Eichmann as a character. The interesting idea, even if we could psychoanalyze it, or him, you know, where does that get us now? And um, you know, there's a book that's out of print that, well, that somebody else should make. That the, so Reverend Hull, who's sort of in the background, had complete access to him while he was in prison and I think had 13 or 17 visits with him and it's all written in a book. You know, his wife spoke German and they would go there and have these meetings with him. They were trying to convince him to accept Christ so he wouldn't go to hell. And it's a fascinating book and um, what's his first name I think is William Hull, Reverend William Hull. It's out there, I, mean, I found it, but uh, you know, it's a used book somewhere. Um, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, the film was mostly shot on 16 millimeter? Completely. Completely. Totally and completely. And I think the first one in almost a decade there. So that was its own. So right, height of COVID, film. Um, luckily, Duty, one of our great producers, is not here. I think in the last time he could, uh, participated in one of these, he said he wanted to kill me. <laughs> um, but it worked out. No, no problems, amazing lab in Romania where we would ship it and um, no snafus. 
and and your own Sharf, of course. Your own Sharf is a great cinematographer, uh, based there, you know. And I, I'm accustomed to working with somebody that I've worked with a few times that I like very much. But when I would, went to make the movie in Hebrew, I also wanted to try to fortify myself with as many people who could whisper in my ear and say, that was not right, or that was bad, you know, don't, so, so it all shifted also, everything was shut down, and I couldn't bring any, you know, collaborators from outside, but, um, but he's so wonderful, you know, he photographed our boys, and um, I mean, so many great things there. Yeah, the, the look and feel of the film is so special, it's very evocative. Um, and the settings are interesting. What can you tell us a little bit about the factory? Yes, the, the, so the factory, also the factory and uh, the prison, I think, are now gone. You know, things move very fast there. Life moves very fast there, and certainly um, construction. So um, the factory is in the old Carmel Winery in Rishon Letzion, um, and we thought it was going to be torn down when we first got shut down, and and they kept it for us, but they sent me videos a, a month or two after we left. It was all torn down. The factory itself we built inside of a shell of a place. Um, that's a set, a great set by Eitan Levy. And I think you shot some in, in Ukraine, is that correct? We did, we shot a very little bit in Ukraine. We were there for a few days. Um, of course, having no idea anything like this would happen. Um, I'm in touch with a couple of the crew members from there, both of whom are actually, thankfully, not there. Um, what's to say? All the way in the back. The, the, it'll be easier for us to hear if you wait one second for the mic. The part about the crematorium, is that a true uh, story? Oh, yes. So, you know, true is always tricky with these kinds of things. It's not something that I, I suppose we would, you know, qualify for the kind of movie that could say inspired by true events or one of those things. And there is some disclaimer, you know, at the end. But, but we decided, let's change the names and not be held to those sorts of things. We're going off of individual um, testimony, basically. This is my story. This is what happened. And then you're making choices within that. So I'm not a journalist and I'm not a historian and I don't, feel bound to those kinds of things as I don't, you know, I don't think narrative filmmakers have to be. So in a way, I feel like it's almost better to further distance yourself from those kinds of things. Well, you know, I mean, Eichmann's different. That's a public fact. And yes, he was burned in the oven and he was held in these prisons and he was guarded by, um, you know, non-Ashkenazi guards. And so all of those things but then the rest of it, you know, you're, you have this young, uh, in the movie, young boy, now an older man, telling you, I participated in this. And then you talk to his colleagues who say, no kid worked there. So we're making a choice to tell the story from David's perspective. I believe David, but it doesn't mean it's... And I think that's part of, obviously, what the ending of the movie is, who gets believed. So when you start to work testimony and those things into a story like this, and we think about how it applies, um, to the Holocaust in particular, and the way we're going to interact with it. You know, soon, you know, the Poland section of the movie is based on um, Mickey Goldman. Mickey Goldman's still alive at 97. Ron, his son, is one of our producers and a great friend. Um, even with Mickey, you want to have the ability, in a way that's the, you know, Mickey and Ava story, Ava who is, who is his wife and they're still together and, um, but I don't want to say it's Mickey because Mickey didn't necessarily say those words that way and yes, this goes in a certain way, but did he take a trip and, you know, go to Poland and get challenged about these things and have this sort of that way? No, but you know, these things have happened in various ways. The, um, the haircut scene is very intense to watch. Was it as intense to film it? Everything, you know, we had to do, it was a very, very, very short schedule. So, you know, everything was planned as best we could, but we had tremendous uh, problems. You know, the, 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 the biggest, the first night of the shoot, there were, there were two 16 millimeter cameras in Israel that we had been told had been serviced, you know, before we started. They both broke the first night. 
and um, there was a third one that was on a commercial somewhere, and we were waiting. There was an hour of the night where we just were sitting there waiting for this camera to appear. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. It, yeah. Question right here. Um, first, as a child of a Holocaust survivor whose grandparents and aunt died in Auschwitz and my uncle survived, this is the most cathartic Holocaust film I've ever seen. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank it's you for so saying powerful. that. Wow. Um, as, a <laughs> as a documentary filmmaker who knows Duty well and also has done several Holocaust films, you have my total kudos. <laughs> Um, my question is, and there's so many questions I have, is do you speak a fluent Hebrew? Because no, no, no. I mean, I can, you know, I can read it. I have, you know, uh, bar mitzvah Hebrew. But it improved a lot on this. <laughs> did you have a translator on the set? Because when I did Partisans of Vilna, we did. So I'm just curious. Everybody speaks English so well. That's true. And the, o and the only person, you know, who wasn't quite there with it yet was the young boy. And... Um, and that was very, it was very easy to have people kind of, so we didn't have to have a real interpreter because everybody's kind of speaking to me in, in English. And did, did Eichmann get the letter? Because I thought he... No. No. No, no, no. So that's so almost it. like one, that's almost like a figment, you know, one of okay. these things that, that come up. What do you do with these things when they happen in their business? Concerns, you know, there's wife coming and how they're notifying her and things. And, Well, yes, I mean, so, so we, have, we have some of our people from Cohen Media who are releasing the movie, and I think they haven't quite landed on their date yet. I know they'd like to do more of, more showings like this around the country, so I hope we'll do a lot of it. It's so nice to sort of show it to a full audience. <laughs> Any other questions before, oh yes, right here, front row. Hi, well, first of all, Aviva, you, you, you summed it up. It's phenomenal. Movie. Thank you. It is just, let me tell you my story with, with that fun. 1961, we were in Poland. When this thing came out with Eichmann, everybody was crying, including the Polish communists. Right. Okay, the, 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 whole, the whole idea of getting Eichmann out of Argentina was never discussed like, Oh, this is a legal issue. How could you? No, it was it was just, you know, tears of joy, and and the only thing was we were shaking. My God, will Israelis do the right thing, or do they let them go? And you know, and uh, as 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 for the comments somebody made in '61, in '61, American people were coming to Auschwitz. Mm. Okay, that, that, there's no doubt about that. Yes. Uh, Israel and, and, and Poland at that time were, were very close. Right. It, it, it's only the Six Day War which blew everything apart. Uh, so, you know, after he, he, he was done with that, that monster, and, and in Poland, Jews, Polish people, Christians, Jew, uh, Muslim, no Muslims, everybody was on the same page. It was a monstrosity. Right? So, so it's, it's, uh, when I came to the United States and, uh, and read uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, The Banality of Evil, I said, really? You, you want to really discuss that? And, and, and this is the big discussion, and uh, Hannah Arnett ad, ends up in, a, in, a, in, a, in a hot water, and, and you know, when it's uh, uh, some, some of the banality of evil is interpreted as Jews were actually part of Holocaust, you know, the Kapos mm. and the Juden route, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it became like a very messy story. And, and so when I came today, I said, okay, let's see what this kid can add to it. And you did. <laughs> Fabulous. Oh, I'm so pleased. Completely Thank you. new dimension. Thank you. It's a new dimension. It is, it is it's going to take me another five years to figure out what you did. <laughs> but, but the detail was phenomenal. You know, this, 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 uh, uh, father and son exchanging shoes mm. because he want to present the kid better. You know, it is, it is, it's a cinema veritas. It's yeah. fabulous. Of course he spoke Arabic. He was two years from, from uh, you know, from Libya. 
You know, of course we speak Polish two years after Poland. Yes. You know, it's, 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 it's very natural. Uh, grand, uh, really grand. Thank you, thank, thank you. you so much. That means not so much. Well, I think that's a wonderful note to wrap things sure up Sure is. On. Thank you so much. Please, thank you, Aviva. Really appreciate it.